GPT-4 Can't Reason and the surrounding drama. So a new paper just dropped called GPT-4 Can't Reason. People are having a field day with it. Paper states that GPT-4 at present is utterly incapable of reasoning. And there's lots of people that are very excited about it. It seems to prove that they're correct. The GPT-4 is just a stochastic parrot and is not able to reason in any way or another. Andrew Nell recently posted a paper about how large language models really understand the world, how they build a sort of model of how the world works, which makes him comfortable saying that they do understand. We'll be covering this paper in a little bit, to which people are replying that, well, no, here's a paper saying GPT-4 can't reason. Problem is that people that are using GPT-4 and have some skills with using it are getting different results from what this paper suggests. Here's a tweet that I think summarizes the issue. GPT-4 can't reason. Asks GPT to do arithmetic, count things, and solve logic problems that most humans would fail. Doesn't use chain of thought and concludes that it is utterly incapable of reasoning. How far the goalposts have moved. Gary and Marcus had a field day with this. But when people ran their own experiments and reported their results, he would attack them, saying this is a perfect encapsulation of what's wrong with the culture of AI today. Now, Marcus does seem to attack quite a bit of people and spends a good amount of time just apologizing for the stuff he said. Here's a response that I think summarizes what a lot of people want to say to him. Gary, with all due respect, your only contribution to this course is cataloging failures and, as Jeremy noted, being a bully. Yes, we know AI needs to be improved. Many smart people are working on it and making progress. Lead, follow, or get out of the way. The author of the paper and what he thinks about LLM believers. But with that said, let's see if any of this is true. GPT-4 can't reason by Konstantin Arkudas. And his whole point is that these systems are still severely limited in their reasoning abilities. In this article, he will argue that the best LLM at this time, GPT-4, is utterly incapable of reasoning in spite of its sporadic displays of ingenuity. So here he's talking to specifically about LLMs, large language models like GPT-4. And he does seem to have a pretty low opinion of LLM enthusiasts. They have rosy predictions that rely excessively on every changing scaling laws, flimsy empirical evidence, and a host of questionable assumptions, as well as some dogmatic beliefs and magical learning abilities. This means that no LLM, no matter how large or extensively and cleverly trained and tuned, will ever be able to crack an arbitrary reasoning problem. He asks, is it impossible to build something like an LLM-based system with the reasoning ability of a well-trained engineer of average intelligence? And he thinks that it's implausible for a number of reasons. I believe the results show unequivocally that GPT-4 cannot reason. Then he goes on to say, LLM believers will probably demur. Now I found this LLM believers to be very interesting. What does he mean when he says LLM believers? I decided to ask ChatGPT. A paper that is critical of an LLM's ability to think refers to people arguing against it as LLM believers. What is the author trying to say by calling them believers? Let's see. The term believers here is employed rhetorically by the author to characterize those who argue in favor of large language models as having faith or conviction in their abilities of these models rather than relying solely on empirical evidence or logical reasoning. By labeling one group as believers, the author may be trying to position themselves as more irrational or objective, undermining the opposition and possibly using pejorative language. Referring to someone as a believer in a scientific or technical debate could be seen as pejorative or dismissive. It may be an attempt to marginalize or belittle the views of those who disagree with the author's position. But I digress. Let's continue. LM believers will probably demur, but humans also make mistakes and surely we're not prepared to say that humans can't reason just because they make mistakes. This gentleman says, first, it's not accurate to say without qualifications that human, humans can reason. In order to have proficiency at reasoning, you have to have significant training and discipline. Focusing on the reasoning skills of untrained people is a bit like focusing on the singing skills of the general population. Everybody sings in the shower, but without formal training or at least exceptional talent, the results are usually regrettable. What I think he's trying to say here is that he can reason because of his significant training and reasoning. But you, silly LLM believer, you cannot. Next, he defines what reasoning is, which is broadly put, reasoning is the process of drawing and evaluating conclusions from a given body of information. More, more precisely, it is the process of making and more importantly, justifying arguments. Anyways, in this paper, he will show unequivocally that GPT-4 cannot reason. The errors are too pervasive and too egregious. GPT-4 doesn't solve even one 
of the 21 problems discussed here. So let's dive in. My custom instructions, chain of thought reasoning, and how I've learned to love chat GPT. So let's look really fast at the custom instructions that I have. It says, always spend a few sentences explaining background context, assumptions, and step-by-step -step thinking before you try to answer a question. Now, I have a lot of different custom instructions that I flip through, but for the purposes of this one, I'm using this particular set. And simply what it does is it forces ChatGPT or GPT-4, it, it helps kick it into chain of thought reasoning. Meaning if I'm asking it a question, it first tries to think through it before answering. So we're going to click save and uh, let's get started. Let's test your reasoning abilities. What's 1,405 times 1,421? And we'll start with the first one. Select two random numbers between 138 and 1453 and multiply them together, reporting the result. Let's see what happens. Now here, this is code interpreter. So what it's doing is thinking through the problem. It's creating a little Python script to create two random integers between, you know, the starting and the ending point, and then it multiplies them together. And then it outputs the results of multiplying those two numbers together. Now, now if there's any unbelievers out there, here's a calculator that gives me the same answer. Now, some of you may be saying, but wait, that's cheating. This is code interpreter that allows it to write scripts and calculate things together. That's fine. Then you do this. You select two random numbers between those two numbers and then multiply them together without a calculator. If you can't, that means you can't reason. By the way, the normal GPT-4 without code interpreter produces the same result. Let's test your reasoning abilities. Count how many characters you see below. Next on the list, we have how many times is P negated in the following for formula? And it gives this formula. So let me grab that. We'll throw that in there and let's see what it says. So basically, each, each one of these little things uh, negates the P. So the formula consists of a variable P that is preceded by a series of negation symbols, tilde. To calculate the total number of negations, we can count the number of tilde symbols and determine if the final effect on P is a negation or not. Here's a step-by-step -step calculation. Count the total number of those symbols and determine the effects of those negations. Since each negation inverts the previous state, an odd number of negations will result in a negation of P, while an even number will not negate P. Let's proceed with the results. It counts how many of those there are. Then it writes a formula that checks if it's odd or even. And based on that, it says the given formula contains a to total of 27 symbols, tilde symbols, negations. Since 27 is an odd number, the variable P will be negated after applying all these negations. So the final effect of P is that it is negated. So not only does it answer the question, how many times is it negated? It kind of figures out what you're actually trying to get to. And that is if it's negated or reversed, which will depend on whether it's an odd or even number of these symbols. And it even answered that question. This is the paper from Constantine. So here he manages to get the incorrect answer out of GPT-4. How? I don't know. Medical common sense. All right, next, medical common sense. Mabel's heart rate at 9 a.m. was 75 BPM and her blood pressure at 7 p.m. was uh, 120 or 80. She died at 11 p.m. Was she alive at noon? So as you can see here, it starts uh, breaking down some of the things that it's sort of learning. So it says, well, we know she was alive at this time and we know that she's alive here. We, this is, we know she died this. And then it reasons since noon falls between 9 and 11 p.m., we can logically infer that Mabel was indeed alive at noon on that day, which is not the response that this guy got where GPT-4 says we can't make a certain determination. And it says medical information can be co complex and nuanced. And so he's saying no comment is needed here. Though the gratuitous by, by now, de rigueur piece of legalese issuing the vague disclaimer at the end, this is a complex issue and make sure to consult with a professional seems ironic. This guy sounds great. Let's test your reasoning abilities. Solve this equation. You have two minutes. Now, before we go on, there's a lot of problems here that I'm not going to go over because I feel like they're not really good problems because like if you walked up to a ra random stranger on the street and asked them this question or this question or anything like this, and even stuff like this, where you have to graph, you would need some sort of tools for that. People use graphing calculators, at least a pen and paper. Then there's elementary discrete math and then various, uh, paradoxes, etc. I'm not going to do this because I don't think this is a great test of the LLM's reasoning ability. Neither is asking it to count how many characters there are in something. Those aren't really reasoning problems. Let's test your reasoning abilities. Which way is Timbuktu? 
But there are some really good ones that I think do really test GPT for ability to do certain types of reasoning. So for example, this one, spatial reasoning. Suppose I'm in the middle of South Dakota and I'm looking straight down towards the center of Texas. Is Boston to my left or to my right? Let's see. So it starts with, let's visualize the geography of the United States to answer this question. So it understands that that's the first step to try to sort of understand where Boston would be in that scenario. So South Dakota located in the north central part of the U.S., Texas situated to the south of South Dakota, and Boston located in Massachusetts to the northeastern part of the U.S. If you're in South Dakota and looking straight down towards the center of Texas, you'll be facing roughly south. Now, considering the relative positions of South Dakota, Texas, and Boston, Boston is to the east of South Dakota and Texas. If you're facing south, then east would be to your left. Therefore, Boston would be to your left. That seems to check out. Here, he managed to get GPT-4 to say that Boston would be to your right. And then he follows up with a million questions about trying to pick apart specific words that GPT-4 has used. Murder most foul. Anyway, so there's some other ones. So for example, there's this sort of clue who done it type of thing. You're given the following premises. That's the point of it is to figure out who the killer is. So when I type in all those things on this basis of information, determine who killed Aunt Agatha and give it detailed proof that your conclusion follows the premise. And so this is a logic puzzle that he came up with a while back. The conclusion is that Aunt Agatha killed herself. After thinking through it step by step and going through all the sort of premises that were given, ChatGPT comes up with a conclusion that, yes, she's indeed the killer, and the proof is derived by logical deductions from the given premises. It eliminated the other suspects and leaves Aunt Agatha as the only possible killer. Seven cards. Next one is... Seven cards are placed on a table, each of which has a number on one side and a single colored patch on one side. The faces of the cards show 50, 16, red, yellow, 23, green, and 30. Which cards would you have to turn to test the truth of the proposition? That if a card is showing a multiple of four, then the color of the opposite side is yellow. So it thinks about it and says to test this, so we would need to look for instances that would potentially falsify the statement. So the things that you would need to show that are cards that are showing a multiple of four. So it uh, eliminates cards that are not a multiple of four and then cards that are showing yellow. So it eliminates everything that's not yellow. And then the conclusion is to test the truth of a given proposition. You would need to turn the cards showing 16 and yellow, 16 and yellow. The three by three grid of doom. All right. Next one is, and this is a good one. I continue with a furniture arrangement problem that must respect a set of constraints. There are several solutions that are easy to find that he gives us one. We must arrange five pieces of furniture, A through E, on a three by three grid in accordance with the following constraints. And then he gives the constraints. So basically, A must not be adjacent to C. Nothing is to the right of E. If D and A are not adjacent, then B should be in the middle. D is above all others. E and D are adjacent. So basically, if you think about a three by three grid, you have to arrange the furniture in such a way that all these sort of rules are followed. Now, this one was fascinating for me to go through. Let's plug it into Chad GPT. So I'm just going to copy and paste it exactly as it appears. So it starts with writing out all of the constraints. Wes went down a nerd rabbit hole with this one. I'm going to jump in and summarize. GPT-4 failed on its first attempt. Here's what I think is happening in this scenario. I think for whatever reason, ChatGPT, GPT-4 is misunderstanding some of these words. Specifically, I think as how they relate to this 3 by 3 grid. So here are a couple of things that I did that allowed it to solve this problem. The problem is about arranging furniture in a 2D model of the room, represented by a 3x3 three three grid. GPT-4 cannot ask follow-up questions or clarify instructions. By asking it to explain, its reasoning step-by-step, step, we can see where it's missing information. So in theory, if we clarified what we were asking, it should be able to solve this problem. And then I did some clarification of terms. Now, again, I'm sure some people will say, well, that's cheating, why can't it understand, blah, blah, blah. But the question here isn't, does it understand English the exact same we do? Does it understand sort of certain shorthand that we use to communicate? That's not the question. The question is, can it read it, right? If you meet somebody that is not a native speaker of your language and maybe use the word that he or she does not understand and misinterprets what you're saying, you wouldn't say that person is incapable of reasoning. You would say, hey, there's a, something lost in translation. So I clarified that not adjacent to uh, means that it can't be to the left, right, top, or bottom of the other piece. And nothing is to the right means that no other piece of furniture is there. To the right of it might be outside the grid. That's another thing that I was struggling with. So for example, if you're placing something here and you said 
nothing can be on the right of it, it wouldn't see this as a potential solution because it said, oh, well, nothing exists on the right. So all I said was nothing to the right of it means that th there's no other piece of furniture there. And above all others means that the very top piece and all other pieces are below it. For example, if it's in the top row, then all the other pieces have to be in the mid and bottom row. Those clarifications got it 90% of the way there. As you can see here, it got very close. The only thing is it would see over here, adjacent to the letter A. And that was bothering me for a while, but then I realized something. As here it says, A must not be adjacent to C. It doesn't think about the reverse of this, that C can't be adjacent to A. So I added this part. A must not be adjacent to C also means that C must not be adjacent to A. And again, the point here is if we can explain all the misunderstandings to it, can it complete this problem? And the answer to that is, yeah, here's what it came up with, which as you can see here is exactly the same thing. So D here at the top right, A, B, E, then C in the center with two empty spaces around it. And it gives us another possible variation which as far as I can tell, also meets all this criteria. Again, here's that final prompt that I gave it. I wrote an example grid and I spelled out some of the terms that were maybe a little bit vague. I explained what not adjacent to meant. And keep in mind, it can't necessarily visualize this the same way we do. So a lot of this came from it just not being able to see this sort of 2D space as, as we would visualize it. And the reason it mistaken this is because just order of operations, once it placed that piece, it didn't go back and recheck if it, if it still satisfied the solution at the end of it. This might be fixed with some recursion or maybe just giving it some more processing power or whatever. This doesn't seem like a fundamental lack of understanding. So I think I'll end it there. I think I've shown enough to see that maybe there's some problems with this uh, paper. At the end, the author here comes up with some solution, potential solutions for how LLMs could make it better. It says that this might work for toy problems, where the type of reasoning is obvious, etc. Interestingly, nowhere does he question if eliminating user error could improve these results. If I can't fly a plane, does that make the plane utterly incapable of flying? Or am I just a silly LLM believer?